night rested upon me, I saw two personages. And that, my friends, is the beginning and the end of the story when it comes to the prophet Joseph Smith. That clip is from a video I saw hundreds of times, and not even just that video, but many, many different iterations of that video growing up. I heard it in stories. I read it in Mormon scripture. The life of Joseph Smith is really one of the foundational principles on which Mormonism is built. Because if Joseph Smith was a prophet, if what he said all happened to him is true, the Mormon church is the true absolute gospel of Jesus Christ restored on the earth today as it proclaims to be. However, <laughs> if he isn't who he says he was, uh, it all is a house of cards that falls apart. It means that this book is a fraud. It, it means it's all a contrived lie and that thousands, really millions of people are living their lives based on a lie of a man from the mid 1800s. Today's video is about the founding of the Mormon church, a church I belonged to for 23 years and my ancestors belonged to back to the time of Joseph Smith. My first family convert on my mom's side joined the church, I believe a year after the Book of Mormon was published. And so today, the goal of this video is to explain the story of the founding of the church and to dive into some historical records and really try to answer the question of how the church was founded and who was Joseph Smith. It feels important to build a picture of what the Mormon church of what Mormons believe Joseph Smith was. Uh, so that is a faithful perspective, right? And to me, that image is one that you must contend with as you decide to start questioning your faith, because you're very much taught a certain version of events. And I see all the time on the ex-Mormon subreddit, people coming and saying, just what is the truth? I only want to make decisions based off of the absolute truth, because as a Mormon, you really do believe you've pursued truth your entire life. And so when the story of Joseph Smith begins to unravel, it feels like this incredibly rock solid foundation on which you believe you've stood starts to shake. I also want to incorporate other faithful sources because it feels important in telling the story of how the church was founded to share the most faithful version along with what all the detractors said, what ex-Mormons say. And so a few sources I'll be pulling from that are faithful, I'll be pulling from the church website, which is what they have online today, the Doctrine and Covenants, which is another book of scripture about the founding of the church. I'll be looking at Preach My Gospel, which is the manual the church uses to help missionaries convert people to the faith. So, so this, is, this is what the missionaries share. So that means this is what investigators believe about Joseph Smith if they're going with what the missionaries say and if they're looking at approved faith faithful sources. And I'll also be using uh, this children's book about Joseph Smith. The reason I wanted to use this is because there's some great pictures, but also it represents to me the exact version of the life of Joseph Smith that I was taught through probably about 16, 17, 18. And still I started to learn some more unfavorable information about him that I had to reckon with. <laughs> And so to begin, I wanted to read this scripture from the Doctrine and Covenants. This is the book of scripture primarily about the founding of the church. It's DNC section 35, verse 3. Joseph Smith, the prophet and seer of the Lord, has done more, save Jesus only, for the salvation of men in this world than any other man that ever lived in it. And this verse is also found as the introduction of the children's book, which I'll be reading from. I heard this verse countless times growing up that essentially, aside from Jesus Christ, Joseph Smith is the second most important man who has ever walked the face of the planet. Hi, Bar. <laughs> I will say a common misconception is that Mormons worship Jesus. I would call it probably more like hero worship. Um, that terminology is obviously 
a very complimentary saying, you know, he was a prophet and there are many prophets in the Bible, but he was the most important prophet that's ever walked the face of the earth, which does seem to put him in a religious and holy category all his own. Joseph Smith, of course, cannot be discussed without also discussing the Book of Mormon, which is, if what he said is true, another testament of Jesus Christ, another book of scripture, the same, if not even better than the Bible, or it is something that was just fabricated and is a lie. And so I think that the character of Joseph Smith, the personhood of who Joseph Smith was as an individual, is intimately tied with the Book of Mormon, the, the process of translating the Book of Mormon. And so that's what I'm really gonna focus on today, are those two aspects of Joseph Smith's early life, his visions, his purported visions, and his book, The Book of Mormon, which he said he translated by the gift and power of God. This is my missionary handbook, Preach My Gospel, and there is one portion that really stood out to me. There is only one time plural marriage or polygamy is mentioned in Preach My Gospel, and it is on this page, and it is under the section, Use the Book of Mormon to Respond to Objections. So I wanted to also read this just as the final little nugget of seasoning before we jump into the life and times of Joseph Smith. All objections whether they be on abortion, plural marriage, seventh-day worship, etc., basically hinge on whether Joseph Smith and his successors were and are prophets of God receiving divine revelation. The only problem the objector has to resolve for himself is whether the Book of Mormon is true. For if the Book of Mormon is true, then Jesus is the Christ, Joseph Smith was his prophet, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is true and is being led today by a prophet receiving revelation. Our main task is to declare the gospel and to do it effectively. We are not obligated to answer every question. Every man eventually is backed up to the wall of faith, and there he must make his stand. Right, and so I use that approach quite often on my mission. If someone had a concern about anything, the answer was supposed to be, is the Book of Mormon true or isn't it? Which is really a way to get through and past a lot of people's very legitimate concerns and to really just obfuscate and make unclear the purpose of the concern. Having a concern about polygamy and Joseph Smith's polygamy, that should be a legitimate concern. If you're going to join a church, people should be able to ask those sorts of questions. But for the missionaries to receive training that they should not engage on anything other than the grounds on which the Book of Mormon is what it says it is, allows them to kind of sidestep and almost mentally bury any concerns that they may feel like are really worthwhile in the end. I'll be reading from a book called No Man Knows My History by Fawn Brody. This is one of the most referenced books about Joseph Smith. It was written by an ex-member in the 40s and then revised and updated in the 70s. I'll also be referencing Rough Stone Rolling, which is from a faithful perspective. Both are very long histories and both uh, feel like they do have some bias and some skin in the game as far as investigating Joseph Smith's character. And I will say that's one of the most difficult aspects of trying to really get down to the truth about Joseph Smith, what were his motivations, what really happened, because anyone who cares enough to ask these questions has inherent bias. And so I'll go into that saying that, obviously, if you are familiar with my content at all, I am an ex-member too. And so I am going to attempt as much as is possible to read from direct sources, to analyze from direct sources, quote from the quotations themselves and not just the authors. But I will say that it's very worthwhile to always do your best to investigate primary sources when you are trying to figure out what happened in history. As, as we investigate primary sources, it's also important to ask when the primary source was written and under what context. So a lot of the so a lot of what we know about Joseph Smith that he said in his own words was written after the Book of Mormon was published after Joseph Smith was already a well-known prophet and figure in the United States. And so his information about his visions, about the way that all of this came to be, very much came after many of the cards had fallen. People recognized him as a prophet. The Book of Mormon was already published. And so that, and so it's very worthwhile to investigate 
his accounting of himself because it's not like he was writing this in his journal the day of he was writing it in hindsight by almost 15 20 years in some cases same thing with the accounting of his mother much of what we know about joseph's early life came from his mother a lot of that though that she wrote came after joseph smith was already dead and so it's very worthwhile to ask when was that quote actually written who said it uh, under what context, you know, was it a court case? Was it under oath? Was it a journal? Was it written in a newspaper? These questions need to be asked. And so often when I was growing up and seeing these quotes about these visions, I always figured, you know, or assumed because it wasn't made clear that Joseph Smith, you know, had these visions. He goes home, he tells his mommy, he tells his daddy, he writes it in his journal. And it's all very much being talked about and written about at the time. Unfortunately, that isn't the case. And in many ways to me, it feels that a lot of these stories were embellished or invented after the fact because it cultivates a story of the founding of the church. And we'll get into some examples of what those stories are. If nothing else, there is obviously evidence that many, many people believed what Joseph Smith was saying at the time. There's also evidence many, many people called him a heretic in, in contemporary times, people who lived alongside him. Joseph Smith was obviously a divisive character. As the church was founded, he had to move back and forth constantly to escape people who were out to get him. As a kid, I always understood that the reason Joseph Smith was so hated was because he preached the truth, because he had so much truth that people got upset. And that's another kind of premise I wanted to investigate as I uh, approached this new study and, you know, my outline for today's video is why did people dislike him? Uh, why were the Mormons so persecuted? Because I, like I said, I really believed it was because the version of Christianity that they were teaching was so pure and so true and so revolutionary that it made people so angry that they would tar and feather Joseph Smith. But then, you know, when you get into it, there were a lot of contempt, there were a lot of people at the time proclaiming they had visions. There and so when and so when we are attempting to answer the question of why was he persecuted, we can't just look at the fact that what he was teaching, the doctrine itself, was inherently different from the accepted beliefs of the time. There are other elements too, because lots of people were preaching things that weren't traditionally accepted by mainstream Christianity. There were a lot of offshoot religions, some would call cults. There were a lot of people cr proclaiming to be prophets. So we have to ask, why was there so much persecution around Mormonism, Mormons, Joseph Smith, and what was it about them that made people so upset? Was it polygamy? Was it the Book of Mormon? Was it Joseph Smith's treasure digging? Even, even in 1826, before the Book of Mormon was published, when Joseph Smith was 21, he went to court for a trial over treasure digging. He had to appear before a justice of the peace because of disorderly conduct, which is certainly something I never knew growing up, spending hours and hours dedicated to learning the story of Joseph Smith. To read from this children's book, uh, this is what I was taught as a child. Although the church grew rapidly, Joseph suffered much persecution for proclaiming he had seen a vision. He was arrested many times, tarred and feathered, and mocked by evil people. Still, he would not deny what he knew to be true. That may, makes it sound, that, that literally says he was persecuted because of his doctrine and his truthiness and that he was arrested, I guess we're supposed to infer, for teaching that God and Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost are three separate beings. However, though, if you look at a lot of the documentation, a lot of the court documents, a lot of what people said at the time were the reasons why these things were happening to him, it wasn't just because he was teaching new doctrine. And to me, that is a very misleading way to depict the things that happened to Joseph Smith, that they were all because he was being persecuted for being a modern day prophet. There are, of course, many instances of people who at one time really believed Joseph Smith and then later 
discount what they previously said and say, well, this is what was really happening. And then they get rebaptized and then they say they believe again. And it's a very hard to figure out, even from one individual, what the truth is. For example, Oliver Cowdery is a person who helped Joseph Smith translate the Book of Mormon. In, in his adulthood, there were some times where he was a believer and there were other times he was not a believer. Let's read the different accounts about the translation of the Book of Mormon from the two times of his life. When he was a believer, he said, these days were to never be forgotten, to sit under the sound of a voice dictated by the inspiration of heaven awakened the utmost gratitude of this bosom. But on another occasion, he admitted, this is when he no longer believes... <laughs> I had seasons of skepticism in which I did seriously wonder whether the prophet and I were men in our sober senses when we would be translating from plates through the Urim and Thummim and the plates not be in sight at all. And so we see from the literal same person, Oliver Cowdery, moments when he felt that what he was engaged in was a marvelous work and a wonder, and then late, and later wondering if him and Joseph were even sober when they were using these strange instruments to translate a book that was not even in the room with them. Disillusionment definitely casts things in a new light, and that's how I feel too. If you had asked me to make a YouTube video about Joseph Smith when I was 19, 19, it would be full of tears, it would be full of reverence, it would be full of testimony bearing, and would not in any way uh, match the vibe and tone of today's video. Let's jump into Joseph Smith's early life now that I've given you a lot of context under which I'll share this information. But before we do, just a reminder to like and subscribe to my channel, comment on this video if you have experiences with Joseph Smith growing up, if you have firsthand accounts if you have books you recommend or if you disagree with me uh, feel free to comment on you know anything that comes to your mind as you're watching the video if you haven't checked out my book yet how to leave the mormon church this is a uh, an ex-mormon's guide to rebuilding after religion and uh, it took me about two years to write this it is everything i learned about what it's like to leave the faith try coffee for the first time get new underwear anything from renegotiating political opinions to how to tell your family for the first time everything you might hopefully need to know as you're leaving the church and it's written from a suggestion point of view it is not written from a here's the the way you leave the church it is not prescriptive it is simply a book of suggestions there's a lot of journaling that i suggest so it's meant to be something to help you with introspection not meant to tell you what to do as you leave the church Let's discuss the version of events as presented by the church and what I grew up with. Joseph Smith was born in Vermont to Lucy Mack Smith and Joseph Smith Sr. This baby, Joseph Smith, was to restore the gospel of Jesus Christ on the earth today. Uh, this is another famous story that members, every member would know that Joseph Smith had an illness and he needed to have basically a surgery performed on his leg. There was no pain. There was no pain medicine at the time. Uh, they tried to get him to drink a glass of liquor and he refused, which is meant to essentially set us up for the word of wisdom, which is why Joseph, which is why Mormons don't drink alcohol. Uh, there's this story about him and his leg and the story of Joseph Smith uh, being a poor plowboy with not much education. When he's 14 years old, he goes into the woods and uh, questions which church he should join and God the Father and jo and God the Father and Jesus Christ the Son appear to him and say none of the churches are true they draw near to me with their lips but their heart are far but their hearts are far from me and that uh, they basically just say join none of them joseph smith said he told a preacher about this event the preacher said no one sees visions anymore when he's 17 an an angel visits him and asks him to uh, go and find the gold plates and that he will uh, translate them so uh, I'm going to pause there because that's a lot of history to cover. This children's book is very much drawing from the story told in the Doctrine and Covenants of the early life of Joseph Smith and is the accepted version, which is what I was taught growing up. <laughs> Let's discuss, though, a little bit about other things that were happening in his life at this time that I did not know about growing up. So I never heard of Joseph Smith's treasure digging growing up. 
Uh, Bushman, as he writes about it, does write about it from a faithful perspective and essentially says that Joseph Smith going on these treasure digging expeditions, looking through stones, using divining rods, using kind of magical ways of figuring out where to find treasure were a way that kind of God was teaching him and preparing him to find the Book of Mormon, to translate the Book of Mormon, and that it essentially, you know, he's saying it did happen, <laughs> um, but he's saying that it was because the Lord was preparing him and that it helped him not reject the craziness of the visions he would have, but to, to be primed to say, I believe these things can happen. I believe in magic. I believe in personages. And uh, that that would help him be prepared to accept the angel Moroni when he visited him in his room and uh, to translate the plates. The church, I think, for quite a long time has had a strange relationship with the, the treasure digging, the treasure seeking of Joseph Smith. Uh, there are times that it's it's definitely, I think, been downplayed. I'll link below. This is an article, though, from the church's approved website uh, about the treasure seeking, which explains a little bit more in depth from a faithful point of view. To read from Rough Stone Rolling, uh, money digging was epidemic in upstate New York. Stories of spirits guarding buried treasure were deeply en enmeshed in the region's rural culture. In Vermont, too, buried treasure and lost mines were detected through dreams, divining rods, or stones. In case you don't know what divining rods are, this is a method that was historically used to find water, but also was used to find uh, treasure. This is a clip from a YouTube video of a man explaining how divining rods work. He, he calls it dousing in this video, but this is the same thing as divining rods. Let's watch how it works. Thumbs on the top of the rods, a nice grip on the hands. The first question we ask is, what way would you go for the answer yes? And as you can see, my rods are crossing. Open. What way would you go for the answer no? As you can see, you only need a little bit of movement, but no is opening up. So that is the very scientific way divining rods work. Uh, and that's most of treasure digging from this time. A charismatic person or a person who seems wise potentially might say, I know where the treasure is. Here's the method by which we'll find it and does kind of some sort of hokey pokey. You know, in this video, I'll put the link in the description. He says he very much believes it. I'm sure he does. Uh, but historically, people who would say they could find treasure would use these sorts of kind of magic, some would say trickery, some would say to say that they would be able to find buried treasure. Brody also covers the fact that this type of treasure seeking was possible. New England was full of treasure hunters, poor, desperate farmers who, having unwittingly purchased acres of rocks, look to the same rocks to yield up golden recompense for their back-breaking toil. Joseph Smith, the soon-to-be prophet, became well-known as someone who was good at this treasure-seeking. There were a lot of people of the time who would say that they hired him to find treasure on their property. For example, William Stafford swore that Joseph told him there was buried money on his property, but that it could not be secured until a black sheep was taken to the spot, led around in a circle, bleeding with its throat cut. This ritual was necessary to appease the evil spirit guarding the treasure. To gratify my curiosity, Stafford admitted... I let him have a large fat sheep. They afterward informed me that the sheep was killed pursuant to the commandment, but that there was some mistake in this process and it did not have the desired effect. William Stafford wrote that in 1833, though it would have happened more like around the time of 1820. So that's 13 years difference. So similarly so, you know, after Joseph Smith is a prophet, someone goes out and basically collects uh, affidavits from people saying he, Joseph Smith is a con man. Uh, so can we trust the reliability of that? I don't know. And so just like the first vision, we do need to call some of these accounts into question because they were all written over a decade later. Certainly though, certainly though, many, many people were willing to attest to the fact that Joseph Smith was a treasure seeker and many said that he was really good at it. 
And in addition to these early accounts, there are also court records to back up the fact that Joseph Smith was doing this that were recorded, you know, through the legal system of the time. It's worth mentioning, I don't know that there is anything truly troubling, I guess, about treasure seeking on its own. It kind of makes sense. There's a lot of also records of the fact that people were finding a lot of Native American artifacts of the time. Some of them were, and some of them were able to be sold for large amounts of money. And so I'm not saying that treasure seeking necessarily makes him a bad person or even that necessarily it should be considered that weird because everyone was kind of doing it at that time. It's not like they had modern science or iPhones. Uh, but I do think it's worth investigating and thinking about how this plays into the later context of the church and the fact that at the top of most LDS temples, you'll see an angel Moroni, which is actually essentially an, a Native American prophet and is a personage who appeared to Joseph Smith to tell him where to find buried treasure. The story of buried treasure is inherently important to the story of who Joseph Smith was and to what the Book of Mormon would become. I think too the church changing their Google Maps logo from the angel Moroni to the cross upon which Jesus was crucified signifies too the the attempt to remove themselves more and more from these early magic beginnings of Mormonism and center themselves more fully in Christianity, mainstream Christianity. We're kind of just like everybody else. We love Jesus. We focus on the Savior. And that that has more pivoted from the focus. You know, Joseph Smith spent a lot of time thinking about the Book of Mormon. He spent a lot of time talking about the gold plates, the golden Bible. And the church today is much more about how you know, the Book of Mormon is another testament of Jesus Christ. We are centered in Christ. We are the church of Jesus Christ. And there's a pivot, right, from divining rods and seer stones into Jesus Christ and Christianity. Similarly so, we can see that a lot of Christianity itself comes from paganism, comes from you know, pre-Christian traditions, comes from things like summer solstices, winter solstices, equinoxes, things that uh, very early people, people pre-Christ practiced, believed in traditions like that, that then Christianity kind of took and said, okay, we have people who like this pagan holiday, let's put Jesus, stamp Jesus on it, and we'll make it into a Christian holiday. And so it is very common within religion to take a, a pre-existing tradition that seems strange and then put Christianity in the center of it, to take divining rods, seer stones, and to say, this is actually the work of Jesus. It's worth noting, though, of course, that this is not this true story of what they purport Joseph Smith to be. They center only God and only Jesus Christ in the very official narrative of the church. Though they mention treasure seeking, you know, in some places deep when you can find it, you know, when you Google the right thing and find the page. But if you go to a Mormon church, if you go to an LDS church, you are not going to hear people getting up bearing testimony of Joseph Smith and mentioning a peep stone. You're not going to hear people getting up mentioning the hat that he stared into to translate the Book of Mormon. And so I think that that is where the kind of the rubber hits the road of the truth of it all is that I don't, I guess, necessarily say, see anything wrong with treasure seeking on its own. Even if you go and read the church's, you know, stuff they've put out about this, they are saying, hey, this was just a way for him to make money for his family. What's wrong with that? And I don't think we need to say there was anything ob like obviously morally wrong with it unless he was misleading people, which some people say he was. But at its heart, the deception or the lack of sharing all the information in favor of just sharing the most complimentary information is what feels like a slap in the face is what feels like you've been lied to your whole life. And the answer would be, you haven't been lied to. We just told you some of the story. And honestly, emotionally, it doesn't feel that way uh, at all. Let's get a little bit into the first vision, uh, a hotly contested topic, which I will try my best to cover thoroughly. Uh, the first vision does feel in many ways like what Mormonism hinges on. It's the founding story. And as I shared, it very much feels like 
Joseph Smith went home that day or that week. He told his mom, he told a Methodist preacher, uh, and that these things were kind of pretty openly talked about in the family, even in the community uh, at the moment it was happening when Joseph Smith was 14. There are many different versions of the first vision and all of them add information, leave information out. The first published account was in 1832, which was two years after the publishing of the Book of Mormon and uh, 13 years after 1820, which is when Joseph Smith said it happened. Bushman, the faithful author, says that this is because Joseph Smith was shy. He was unsure of himself. He, w he didn't want to go around telling everybody about this vision uh, because he worried he'd be made fun of because he was just a 14-year-old boy. That's his faithful take on why it wasn't discussed. Uh, Brody the ex-Mormon says that the reason nobody heard a single, you know, word about the first vision until over a decade later was because it didn't happen. And after he had success, he looked back in time and began to spin this marvelous tale to tell to his followers. Some of the accountings say he was 14, some 15, 16, or 17. Uh, some say that it was God that appeared. Some say it was two personages. Some say it was a pillar of light. Uh, and even the intent why he went and go, goes to go pray in the woods is different in each of these versions. And one of the other common defenses of this is, you know, when you're telling a story that happened a long time ago, it's hard to get all of the, uh, the details right. I do think, you know, if I'm trying to tell the story of me going to the grocery store 10 years ago, I'm going to have a really hard time cobbling together a story about what happened. And I'll probably stick to generalities and get any details mostly wrong. However, I do think that uh, seeing God and Jesus Christ in the flesh appear to you isn't like going to the grocery store. To me, this type of an event, it's hard to say like, oh, he just didn't remember it that well because it was forgettable. Um, that would be the most, most earth shattering moment of your life. That would be a transcendent experience uh, that obviously would stick with you. You know, seeing literally God and you're forgetting the details, um, and you're for even forgetting not even the details, but some of the most, like, even who it was you saw. Was it a pillar of light? Or, or was it two personages who looked like humans but were glowing and said they were God? You know, this is my son, hear him. As I said, the first account was published in 1832. The account that I drew from for the child's book and then the one that is accepted LDS scripture was written in 1838. So if the vision was, you know, in 1820, Joseph Smith wrote the official version in 1838. That's 18 years later. Uh, at this point, he was a hugely celebrated figure and obviously he's writing for a different audience. Uh, if you're writing in your journal the day of the event, you're probably going to describe it differently than if you're writing it, you know, 18 years later for an audience of your truest fans. We don't have any journal writings from him. We don't have any journal writings from his mother. Uh, we just have what he wrote after he was already famous. And so the accounting of the first vision does ultimately feel like it ends up on quite unsturdy ground. I have, of course, often heard of the story of Joseph Smith telling a Methodist preacher growing up about the vision, which almost seems that it would give you a little bit of proof that what he said happened did happen because he he went, you know, right after the vision and he talked to a Methodist preacher. So to me, I always pictured that as proof that there was something happening at the time. There was going to be a record of him going and telling this vision, right? Unfortunately, uh, this Methodist preacher is made up, you know, after the fact, there's never a name given. There's never a person identified. Uh, typically when this story is told, um, the minister says, there's no truth in what you have told me. There are no such things as visions and revelations in these days, and there will never be any more of them. That's in quotes. Uh, and much of when you read this experience is in quotes, the quotations come from the writings of Joseph Smith, though, not as quoted in a written document or a testimony given by the Methodist preacher. So even this person who he goes and tells, which you might think could corroborate the story as a contemporary person who said, yes, this happened to me, seems to be entirely fabricated, or at least there's no one to point to to say that was the person he told 
this is, you know, evidence that Joseph Smith actually did have this vision at this time. It's time stamped. Nope, we don't get that with uh, this story of the minister. As I shared too, I was always under the impression that the reason Joseph Smith was persecuted was because of his vision being so revolutionary. I'm going to read in Rough Stone Rolling. The preacher reacted quickly and negatively, not because of the strangeness of Joseph's story, but because of its familiarity. Subjects of revivals all too often claim to have seen visions. In 1826, a preacher from the Palmyra Academy said he saw Christ descend in a glare of brightness exceeding tenfold the brilliancy of the meridian sun. Uh, and then he goes on to share several other instances of people saying that they saw, uh, saw God. Norris Stearns, one was God my maker, almost in bodily shape of a man. His face was, as it were, a flame, a fire, and his body, as it had been a pillar and a cloud. Below him stood Jesus Christ, my redeemer, in the perfect shape like a man. And so Norris Stearns, in 1815, so that's five years before Joseph said he saw his vision when he was 14 years old, Joseph, uh, Nora Stern's almost verbatim shares the same accounting of seeing God, Heavenly Father, and Jesus Christ standing in the perfect shape like a man. So uh, these visions, this vision, though it's presented often as no one was, no one was doing this. This was revolutionary. He was persecuted because he said he saw God. Nor, you know, there are other people, contemporary of the time, people before him saying the exact same thing. Uh, and also people saying, that's not true. You didn't, you know, that didn't happen to you. But certainly he wasn't persecuted purely because he was the only one who said it. And he was the only one giving a, an accounting of seeing two personages. In Brody, we read, oddly, the Palmyra newspapers, which in later years gave him plenty of unpleasant publicity, took no notice of Joseph's vision at the time it was supposed to have occurred. So there's no evidence that people were upset. There's no evidence that it was in the newspaper. There was no Methodist preacher coming forward to say, this boy is a heretic. Uh, in 1831, one year after the Book of Mormon was published, uh, in a newspaper called the Palmyra Reflector, it, however, appears quite certain that the prophet himself never made any serious pretension to religion until his late pretended uh, revelation, the discovery of the Book of Mormon. And in, in another article, the same newspaper said, it is well known that Joe Smith never pretended to have any communication with angels until a long period after the pretended finding of the book. So it does seem that people of the time, many people said, hey, you kind of made up this vision, the first vision story. We don't believe it. There's no evidence. There's literally not a shred of evidence from a journal writing, a newspaper, a personal witness. There's there's nothing that shows that this actually happened, though though the reason for that is obviously hotly contested. Was it because he was shy? Was it because he made it up? I guess that's on you to decide. We're moving now into the time when Joseph Smith becomes an adult. He's 19, 20 around this time. And so we have a lot more detail about his life, primarily because he is an adult. He's starting to move through the world kind of on his own, away from his family um, and making an adult's decisions. And so there's just more, there's more personal testimony to pull from uh, and from his the people around him at the time. Uh, he goes, his family falls into financial trouble and so he gets hired out to uh, go do some treasure digging for a man named Stoll. Josiah Stoll believed that there was uh, hidden treasure on his property and he had heard a lot of great things about how Joseph Smith was good at using stones and divining rods and that kind of a thing to find buried treasure. And so it says when his men, Stoll's men, failed to locate the cache of treasure, Stoll enlisted the Smith's help and Joseph Smith Sr. and Joseph Smith Jr. agreed to uh, join the diggers in harmony and that they would be paid for their time to try to find this treasure. So Stoll, so Josiah Stoll brings Joseph Smith Jr. and his dad all the way uh, to go live in Harmony. They lodge with a man named Isaac Hale. Um, Isaac Hale was a hunter. He was, had, you know, fairly wealthy, and he was a little bit interested in this treasure digging, but when the men couldn't find anything, he became a little disillusioned and stopped paying the money. Lucy explained that the 
reason he was willing to bring Joseph Smith all the way up to be with them was on account of having heard that he possessed certain keys by which he could discern things invisible to the natural eye. I will say that some of these stones that Joseph Smith said he used were considered uh, very important even later on in the church. For example, in 1880, Wilford Woodruff took one of these stones called a seer stone, a peep stone, and consecrated this stone basically as holy, as, you know, one of the ways, one of the tools by which Joseph Smith translated the Book of Mormon. And the church still has these stones today. I've seen pictures of them. I'll include a picture here. Uh, we don't know that, you know, th there seems to be a lot of mentions of stones and uh, he had favorite stones, that kind of a thing. Um, the, the stone mentioned most often does seem to be the stone that the church has put on display before. It's described as kind of chocolatey colored, um, which does seem to be the stone they have, but a lot of stones are brown. So during this time with Josiah Stoll, uh, they were attempting to find the treasure. They weren't really able to find it. Josiah Stoll still believed, though, in Joseph Smith's ability to, you know, see invisible things. And so even though Joseph's dad goes back to be with their family, Joseph Smith Jr., the soon-to-be prophet, stays in this area and continues to help with um, the treasure digging. This is where we get our first legal document reference to Joseph Smith, which to me feels like one of the most impartial early sources we have of Joseph Smith, purely because it's a court record, it's being written, you know, by the the laws of the time. It's not an ex-Mormon. It's not a family member. It's not an early believer. It's a court record. And so I do feel like this is one thing we can kind of hold on to as more truth, uh, though obviously it's all just human records and humans are all uh, biased in their own ways. So he was, so Joseph Smith was accused of being an imposter and lying about his ability to find treasure by a man named Peter Bridgman. To read, uh, Peter Bridgman, who was a nephew of Josiah Stoll, entered a complaint against Joseph Smith Jr. as a disorderly person. In New York, New York law specified that anyone pretending to have a skill in discovering lost goods should be judged a disorderly person. So this uh, complaint comes against Joseph Smith because he's proclaimed that he can find buried treasure, he can find, you know, uh, lost goods. And so under the law, he can be judged as a disorderly person. Joseph Smith does seem to, you know, speak during this trial. And it says he admitted, Joseph Smith admitted that he had a certain stone, which he, you know, this is actually kind of cool. We have the words of Joseph Smith from when he was about 20 in this court proceeding. He had a certain stone, which he had occasionally looked at to determine where his hidden treasures in the bowels of the earth were, that he had professed to tell in this manner where gold mines were at a distance underground. And he had looked for Mr. Stoll several times and informed him where he could find those treasures. And Mr. Stoll, having been engaged in digging for them, that at um, Palmyra, he pretended to tell by looking at the stone where coined money was buried in Pennsylvania. So he's telling other people too. I, I can use the stone to find treasure, to find coins, that kind of a thing. Joseph Smith said he had occasionally been in the habit of looking at this stone to find lost property for three years, but of late he had given it up. Uh, because of his health, it hurt his eyes, he said. It made them sore. He said he occasionally had been in the habit of looking through the stone to find lost property for three years. He said he had pretty much given it up on account of its injuring his health, especially his eyes. It made him sore that he did not solicit business of this kind. Brody says his testimony, however well-intentioned, did the prisoner more harm than good. Jo Stoll's relatives attacked Joseph bitter bitterly and the court pronounced him guilty. I will say as much as Brody says he was found guilty, um, a, the church website says a purported court document indicates the judge found Joseph guilty. Certainly if he testified on the stand, yes, I have used a stone to find treasure. He's admitting to breaking the law and saying he could claim to f find things that were lost for payment. Um, a friend of the judge who claimed to have taken notes at the hearing wrote that the judges accepted Stoll's testimony and discharged Joseph. So some people say that Joseph was able to rationalize his behavior by the fact that he did have an agreement with Stoll. He wasn't doing this, you know, to mislead people, but that Stoll had actually hired him. Um... So, you know, the outcome of the trial isn't exactly clear. I never heard anything about this, about the treasure digging growing up. Let's read 
the children's book and see, you know, how this historic information plays into the kind of most basic church narrative. We know for a fact, it's historic fact that Stoll did have Joseph come to live with him to find a treasure. Uh, in this book, it gives this whole it gives this whole story one sentence, which is crazy because it is the most historically accurate information we have that is proven by contemporary historic documents. Joseph hired out to earn money to help support his family. He, second sentence, he boarded in the home of Isaac Hale, a well-to-do farmer. What's crazy is that Joseph Smith, the prophet, never would have met Emma Hale, his future first wife, if it were not for this treasure digging story, if it were not for Josiah Stoll hiring him to come and try to find the treasure while he was hired and away from his home. He stayed with Isaac Hale. He met Emma, which put him on the path of marrying her, which is something I am incredibly well uh, acquainted with as uh, uh, someone who grew up in the church. So it is kind of crazy that this little detail about how Joseph Smith ends up meeting Emma is actually part of this treasure digging scheme where he was hired and asked to find treasure and he never was able to. Joseph stayed in harmony and continued to work uh, as a farmhand, it's not clear. It does seem that maybe he potentially was still doing some treasure digging. Uh, Emma and Joseph continued to meet and they did actually ask Emma's father if they could get married, to which he said no, probably because Joseph Smith was, you know, doing this treasure digging. Joseph had just been uh, taken into court for this. So and so Isaac and Elizabeth Hale did not give their permission. On January 17th, 1827, they uh, eloped and they married married in secret so that uh, the father couldn't stop them. This unfortunately means that basically for the, the entirety of Joseph and Emma's marriage, they are kind of uh, outcast from Isaac Hale, which is pretty unfortunate considering that he was pretty well established. Uh, he seemed to have loved Emma dearly. Uh, I think potentially if they had gone about this in a different way or if Joseph had proved himself to, you know, I guess, clean his act up, potentially they would have had a lot more help. But uh, in later stories, Emma and Joseph are fairly destitute despite the fact that Emma's father is fairly moneyed, it seems, and could have helped them uh, because of this choice to go behind his back. Eight months later after their marriage, they returned to Harmony to brave the wrath of Isaac Hale and secure some of the furniture and livestock that Emma owned in her own name. They kind of, I think, needed money. They needed furniture. They needed a, a way to start building their own homestead since she was kind of essentially, you know, wrote herself out of the family by marrying Joseph. Hale, when he met the couple, said, you have stolen my daughter and married her. I had much rather have followed her to her grave. You spend your time in digging for money, pretend to see in a stone, and thus try to deceive people. Um, the account goes on that Joseph wept and acknowledged he could not see in a stone now and never could, and that his former pretensions in that respect were all false. And so this, you know, this is all happening when they're 20, 21. Uh, it sounds like an incredibly sad time where they are choosing to get married. They seemingly love each other. And yet uh, it's caused so much heartache for her family uh, and really financial, almost financial ruin for the early relationship because they didn't have anything uh, after they got married. That's the real story of the marriage of Joseph Smith and Emma. The story I always heard was that they fell in love and that um, that Emma's dad did not approve. Same old line because Joseph Smith was a man of God and he was too, you know, he had some crazy ideas about the way God is and, you know, to, to read the story from the children's book and to say this is exactly what I grew up with understanding. Uh, Joseph hired out to earn money to help support his family. He boarded in the home of Isaac Hale, a well-to-do farmer. Mr. Hale had a lovely daughter named Emma. Joseph and Emma fell in love and were married on eight, January 18th, 1827. Joseph now had a wonderful companion to love and support him. After their marriage, Joseph and Emma moved back to the Smith farm. What's crazy is like all of that is true. They did get married January 18th. He did have a lovely daughter. They did fall in love. Uh, he did have 
a wonderful companion to love and support him. They did move back to the Smith family farm. But in reality, like this is one of the most historically misleading paragraphs I've ever read because it says nothing about their elopement. It says nothing about the treasure digging. It says nothing about the father disapproving of this union. It says nothing at as to why they moved back to the Smith family instead of staying in harmony. Mm, propaganda. <laughs> Let's move into a discussion about the Book of Mormon and where this curious little artifact came from. We will go back a little bit for this because when the angel appeared to Joseph Smith to tell him about the gold plates, it was prior to Emma and Joseph getting married. Joseph Smith was 18 at the time. So we're gonna backtrack a tiny bit, keep that in mind, but we'll catch back up to Emma and Joseph in a little bit. The official accepted narrative when, was that when Joseph Smith was 17 or 18, an angel called the angel Moroni appeared to him and told him about some buried treasure, the gold plates that were uh, located nearby. I will read the accounting of this from Joseph Smith history. This was written after the Book of Mormon was already published, after Joseph Smith was already accepted as a prophet by many different people. And so this is him, similar to the first vision, recounting something that happened over a decade before that he is now uh, kind of telling about, some people say embellishing. Uh, and this is his own words about having an angel appear to him. He had on a loose robe of most exquisite whiteness. It was a whiteness beyond anything I had ever seen. Not only was his robe exceedingly white, but from his whole person, but his whole person was glorious beyond description and his countenance truly like lightning. The room was exceedingly light, not so, but not so very bright as immediately around his person. Skipping ahead to 34 he said there was a book deposited written upon gold plates giving an account of the former inhabitants of this continent and the source from which they sprang the book of mormon he also said that the fullness of the everlasting gospel was contained in it and its inhabitants by the savior to the ancient inhabitants also there were two stones in silver bows we see a stones appear again that these stones fastened to a breastplate constituted what is called the urim and thummim uh, deposited with the plates and the possession uh, and use of these stones were what constituted seers in ancient and former times and that God had prepared them for the purpose of translating the book. He, the, the angel also says in verse 42, uh, again, he told me when I had gotten these plates of which he had spoken, I should not show them to any person, neither the breastplate with the Urim and Thummim, only to those who I should be commanded to show them. If I did, I should be destroyed." So that is uh, the account of this visitation from an angel. Uh, I will say reading this as a kid, I definitely thought this was corroborated by many different documents, whether it be journals, something his mom or father had said, something many of his siblings had written down. Uh, this is, you know, this is basically the first time the saints are hearing about this and it's after the publication of the Book of Mormon. And so, like I've said in the past, Brody, you know, ex-Mormons might say, oh, he's making it up ex post facto because uh, it's, you know, now he's a big hotshot prophet. People are believing what he says. He comes up with this grandiose story about how he found the Book of Mormon. Uh, a Mormon, a faithful person, Person would say he didn't say anything about this because it was so sacred. It was very personal. He was still a young boy. He was shy of retribution. You decide. I will say one thing I remembered looking at this is how when I used to teach people about this on my mission and I would show them this, uh, you might think that that's the Bible, right? This looks this looks like the Bible. It is written in the form of the Bible. And yet this is um, the personal testimony of Joseph Smith about how he found the Book of Mormon and his first vision. Why, why might the church rewrite and reformat uh, Joseph Smith's words to look indecipherable from the King James Version of the Bible or many Bibles? I would say it, it gives it a sense of legitimacy and it also does put it in the realm of scripture. Uh, if I just handed you the same writing you know, in a book, it might just look like a personal testimony or some something someone had written. This makes it look like it's the word of God, which I do think is 
a interesting way of rebranding a lot of, you know, these documents surrounding Joseph Smith is that they take, you know, Joseph Smith's writing himself, his own biography, they take the Doctrine and Covenants, and they reformat it to look indecipherable from scripture from afar. And it gives it a sense of legitimacy that is almost like confusing when I would show investigators, they'd be like, that's weird. Why are you writing it like it's the Bible? And well, it probably because we believe it's scripture, but also because it makes it look like scripture. That is the official version of the Book of Mormon of how Joseph Smith came to find out about the gold plates. I thought it was interesting when I went on the Wikipedia page, I'll put it here, um, for the Book of Mormon, the top of the page which this is not like this is not like this is the only article that this little warning is on, but I do think it's interesting that it's on the Book of Mormon uh, Wikipedia page. It says the neutrality of this article is disputed. Relevant discussions may be found on the talk page. Please do not remove this message until conditions to do so are met. March 2024. So um, I think it's interesting that you know obviously both members and ex members and never members are you know probably mostly just Mormons and non probably just Mormons and ex-Mormons going onto this page and uh, editing it and swaying the bias, right? That's my whole, uh, you know, undertone of this entire video is what bias is. Uh, but, you know, even on the Wikipedia page, meant to be an encyclopedia, obviously the editors of this page cannot seem to agree how to write an unbiased take of definitionally what the Book of Mormon even is. Now I've explained the church narrative of the Book of Mormon. I'll explain a little bit about some of the other, you know, theories and rationales or, or ideas people have put forth as to the origin of the Book of Mormon. Brody, Brody, uh, no man knows my history, very much thinks that this story of the Book of Mormon comes from the huge amount of Native American artifacts and legends that kind of took hold of the community at the time. In Rough Stone Rolling, he also talks about how there were a lot of Native American artifacts found at the time, things buried, they would find burial mounds. To read an account his mother gave later in life during our evening conversations, Joseph would occasionally give us some of the most amusing recitals we could I will also say in this portion, they usually use the term Indian to refer to these people. I will just replace that with Native American since that is the more accepted term to refer to the Native people who were here before the settlers. During our evening conversations, Joseph would occasionally give us some of the most amusing recitals that could be imagined. He would describe the ancient inhabitants of this continent, their dress, mode of traveling, and the animals upon which they rode, their cities, their buildings, with every particular their modes of warfare, also their religious worship, he would do so with much ease, seemingly as if he had spent his whole life with them. And the, this is just one of many accounts how Joseph Smith was very good at telling kind of fantastical stories uh, that were very compelling. There was a story about how someone had found a history of the Native Americans buried at the base of a hollow tree. So um, there were there's evidence that people were already talking about, you know, histories of Native inhabitants inhabitants being buried, people finding them. Uh, Joseph Smith said he saw his vision of Moroni in 1823. In a Palmyra paper in 1821 reported that diggers on the Erie Canal had unearthed several brass plates along with the skeletons and fragments of pottery. So, um, you know, this kind of invention or this uh, idea of plates, of, um, of records of ancient people, certainly that is something that's circulating around Joseph Smith prior to his vision of the angel. Joseph Smith did say in his official account that the angel uh, didn't want him to take the plates initially because he was worried Joseph would sell them and use them for money. When Joseph first sees the plates, he says that he tries to grab them and um, the angel stops him because the angel can see that he's going to be greedy and try to sell them for money. There was this long ongoing period of, of when Joseph was trying to get the plates and he said the angel wouldn't let him. It wasn't until after he married Emma that he was finally able to get the plates. So he said that his first vision was in 1823 and he was finally able to retrieve the plates in 1827. Five years, so about four or five years after the initial vision. And so there are people talking throughout that time saying Joseph was talking about these plates, saying that he was trying to get them and he couldn't 
and he's kind of spinning this tale throughout the community. Uh, but it wasn't until many, but it wasn't until years later that he was finally able to, he said, retrieve the plates out of the ground and the angel let him. They did come with, and it was mentioned in his account, something called the Urim and Thummim and the breastplate, which God said he was going to use to translate the book. Uh, the description of the Urim and Thummim does seem to differ. Some, some, you know, say they looked like spectacles, like glasses. Uh, they're also referred to as stones. He also used his, you know, chocolate-covered peep stone to um, to translate the Book of Mormon. And so the, the accounting of what these actually looked like does seem to change a bit depending on who's talking about it. Uh, it's also unclear if people are hearing Joseph Smith describe it and then describing it back. Some people said they saw it. So the description around the translators themselves does seem to be a bit, you know, all over the place or just lots of different accounts. Most people never saw the gold plates. I will include in a bit, there were three witnesses. So we'll talk about the witnesses. Emma never though was allowed to see them. It is kind of an irony that uh, Joseph Smith said that if someone saw them with the naked eye, uh, they would die, they would perish, they would burn and, you know, they would disappear in a fl flame of smoke. But then he was simultaneously ultra worried all the time that people would take them. So it is kind of an irony to me that, you know, if you see them, you'll burst into flame. But also it's very possible for people to steal them. And also, you know, Joseph wasn't even allowed to get them out of the ground for four years. And yet he's constantly worried people are going to try to take them. So it's kind of this back and forth between, well... Are they going to kill you if you see them or can people easily grab them and go and then, you know, like, which is it? You know, choose a lane. Let me give a little brief outline about what the Book of Mormon is even about. Uh, it is about, like I've said, Native Americans, uh, specifically, mostly the Lamanites and the Nephites, which are the names that are given to two of the most major tribes in the book. Joseph Smith did say that he found the gold plates in what was then renamed the Hill Camorra, uh, Camorra after uh, the name of a battle place within the Book of Mormon, and that the Native American prophet who compiled the gold plates had essentially, before he died, buried them just right where Joseph Smith lived, and that's where, where he, you know, perished, and then Joseph Smith found them thousands of years later. The Book of Mormon is purported to cover a history of about a thousand years from 600 BC to 400 AD. It takes place primarily in the Americas, and it's hard to show you, but throughout the Book of Mormon, it does give you a, a timestamp. So this page says it happened in about 76 BC. This says it happened in about 30, 31 to 32 AD. So there, there are elements kind of in the same way Joseph Smith uh, history is written that make it feel like a much more ironclad historic document because they're, they're giving timestamps, you know, they're, it feels like they carbon dated this thing. There's never been any archeological evidence to prove the Book of Mormon is true. Typically, you know, the Book of Mormon has many, many battles. Uh, the, you, when people battle, you know, it's thousands of people going to war. It describes swords, shields, bows, fortresses. Um, there's never been any archaeological proof to, sh to show that these events took place. So typically when there's, you know, a battle, we would be able to dig and find evidence that the battle, uh, you know, took place with all of the artifacts that would be left behind by the people who did the battle, or at least some of the artifacts. Um, same with the Hill Cumorah, right? The Hill Cumorah does give us a place that is stamped in actual geography where this Native American prophet hid the golden plates where Joseph Smith found them. That was supposedly the same geographic place. Some of the Book of Mormon takes place in Jerusalem. They, they leave Jerusalem and they go and they find a ship which takes them to the Americas. And so these people, Lehi, you know, the Lamanites, the Nephites, they are meant to be descended from um, this originating group of people who came out of Jerusalem. So that means that the Native Americans should have mostly DNA from Jerusalem from the Middle East. So when uh, the, you know, when DNA came out as an accepted science, the church rushed to go do, you know, DNA testing on Native Americans, expecting to find the majority of their DNA to be originating from Jerusalem from the Middle East. 
However, most of their DNA is more based in Siberia, Russia, and East Asia, which is very, very far away from the Jerusalem DNA that they were looking for. So they did change, and I'll put the, the uh, screenshot here, they changed the introduction to the Book of Mormon because it used to claim that the Book of Mormon was a record of the Native Americans whose primary ancestors were from Jerusalem. Uh, and then they changed it to be among the ancestors, which really waters down the claim and basically says, you know, there it's a tiny, tiny amount of DNA that, you know, we can pull back to Jerusalem. And so we are walking back this original bold claim that most Native Americans came from this man, Lehi, uh, who brought his family to the Americas. Similarly, so the church has spent a lot of money on archaeological efforts to try to uncover proof of the peoples storied in the Book of Mormon, uh, have yet to come up with anything. Obviously, they have not uh, dug up the entirety of the continent. So, you know, it, it kind of gives them still some wiggle room. But certainly that the Hill Cumorah where Joseph Smith found the Book of Mormon, found the gold plates, there is no evidence, no archaeological evidence to confirm that there was a Native American prophet who buried these plates and had camp nearby, had people, his family nearby. There's there's not a shred of evidence to truly corroborate this as a historic text. And I think the lack of this evidence to me is more compelling than, you know, a lot of people try to discredit the Book of Mormon by looking at the different, you know, texts that Joseph Smith could have possibly come uh, pulled from to make the book, other authors potentially. Ultimately, we just don't have enough data to decisively prove where the Book of Mormon came from, but we can prove that the claims of the Book of Mormon are not in 2024, there's no evidence to prove, archaeological evidence, which to me is the most compelling proof that the Book of Mormon is kind of a made-up fantasy. In the same way we can't disprove that Joseph Smith saw a vision because it was just him, we, we can't yet disprove that Joseph Smith didn't translate the Book of Mormon because when you say I did something and nobody really was around to watch and the people who were there to watch were like your best friends, uh, it's very hard to disprove. But, you know, DNA is compelling. The lack of hard at artifacts is compelling. Um, but let's get into theories behind where the Book of Mormon really came from. Obviously, Joseph Smith said he translated it by the gift and power of God. There are also, there are tons of theories out there as to where else the Book of Mormon could have come from. A common theory is that the Book of Mormon came from a contemporary book called The View of the Hebrews to read from No Man Knows My History. It may, in fact, may have been the view of the Hebrews that gave Joseph Smith the idea of writing a Native American history in the first place. If the Native Americans are the tribes of Israel, Ethan S Smith says pointedly, some decisive evidence of the fact will ere long be exhibited. The idea that Native Americans came from Hebrews was a popular theory of the time Joseph Smith was going through this translation process, Joseph's familiarity with the theory of the Hebrew... Hebraic origin of the Indian seems, however, to have come chiefly from a popular book by Ethan Smith, a pastor of a, a church in Vermont. This book, The View of the Hebrews, was published in 1823. So 1823, that's long before Joseph Smith is even able to, you know, get the gold plates into his possession. An easy resource you can find to see comparisons between the view of the Hebrews and the Book of Mormon is found in the CES letter, which I'll link to below. The CES letter does a good job at comparing, you know, portions of the book that were very similar, phrases from the book that were similar, and also aspects of the book, like people, animals, that kind of a thing that were similar in the books, which is which is one of the most common theories about where the Book of Mormon really came from. Basically, Joseph Smith had access to this book. He drew upon it as inspiration uh, to write the Book of Mormon. Some people say that people close to Joseph Smith also wrote the book or helped him write a lot of it. Joseph Smith did only have three years of formal schooling, uh, and he wasn't that great at writing, especially at the time of translating the Book of Mormon. He seemed to have learned quite a bit later on in life. This idea that he was just a poor, uneducated schoolboy is a compelling point made by the church. You know, growing up, I heard that a lot, that he was uneducated, that there is no way, you know, even a genius could have done this. And so um, the fact that God used a 
uneducated schoolboy is uh, miraculous and shows God's power. <laughs> Later on, though, there are many claims made about Joseph Smith's genius and how he could, you know, translate and read and speak in all these different languages. And so it, it's a little confusing because at one point, it's a little confusing because I feel like the church kind of wants to have its cake and eat it too. And this desire to call Joseph Smith a genius while also calling him uneducated because he was synonymously both at the same time. I will say too, a lot of the words in the Book of Mormon are taken from the Bible, specifically the King James Version of the Bible. Uh, 25,000 words apparently from the Old Testament and 2,000 words from the New Testament. So, so that's about 27,000 words taken directly from the, 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 the Bible. Um, a lot of the errors in the Bible Joseph Smith had were transcribed into the Book of Mormon. And so that's kind of another you know, red flag because basically if, uh, you know, a native American is writing this information and receiving revelation and writing his revelation. And then Joseph Smith is translating that revelation. Why would there be errors from the Bible <laughs> that Joseph Smith had be in that translation, unless he was literally walking over to his own Bible and reading from his own Bible versus reading from the gold plates which he said he was translating because he didn't he didn't say he was just writing stuff from his bible he said every word of the book of mormon was taken from the gold plates so there shouldn't be errors in another book in a translated record that's pure right <laughs> i think too it's easy to say that a lot of the language and tone and terminology and structure of the Book of Mormon matches very closely to the King matches very closely to the King James version of the Bible, and uh, so there's a so a lot of people say, okay, maybe he took some things from the the view of the Hebrews that book. He took other inspiration from the Bible, which was a book he obviously had huge amounts of access to. It also feels important to discuss the method of translation as uh, a test to by Emma. Emma. Emma, his wife, was one of his primary translators, specifically at the beginning of this whole, you know, translation process. When I was learning about the translation process of the Book of Mormon, I and anyone else who's Mormon likely saw uh, what you would assume to be a fairly typical translation. Here is a picture. You can see here they are depicting Oliver Cowdery as helping him. The, he was not allowed to see the gold plates during a uh, translation, so often they would have a sheet. And then Joseph uh, looks, you know, like he's literally reading from a book. This book is written in reformed Egyptian. He obviously is using the gift and power of God, the spirit, to figure out what it says in English. And then uh, Oliver Cowdery is the one that's writing it down and transcribing it onto his um, paper. That's obviously how I always saw the Book of Mormon being translated to uh, show. I'll show you a portion of the uh, movie that I watched growing up um, that shows the same translation method. Work. The translation continued. Others joined Joseph in this great undertaking. All men must repent and be baptized in his name. So here we see, you know, Joseph has the the sheet. Um, here it looks like Oliver could see the gold plates. Uh, that I haven't really seen evidence of that in any of my research that Joseph was just casually like, here's a little peek. It's, it does seem that Joseph went to great lengths to conceal the plates. Um, so those, but those are still fairly similar, right? Joseph Smith is is pointing at the gold plates, moving his finger, speaking English. That is, that's the translation of the Book of Mormon that I was taught while someone uh, is the scribe, transcribes it down. This is an account uh, from, from Emma. She was his first scribe. This is what she says uh, the translation was like on a daily basis. In writing for Joseph Smith, I frequently wrote day after day, often sitting at the table close by him. He was sitting with his face buried in his hat with the stone in it and dictating hour after hour with nothing between us. He had no book to read from. If he, had, if he had had anything of the kind, he could not have concealed it from me. The plates often lay on the table without any attempt at concealment, wrapped in a small linen cloth 
which I had given him to fold them in. I felt of the plates as they lay on the table, tracing their outline and shape. They seemed to be pliable like thick paper and would rustle with a metallic sound when the edges were moved by the thumb, as one does when one thumbs the edge of a book. So that's quite a bit different, right? Um, and that's that's also what Oliver Cowdery says is that the most typical version, you know, it's always the description is always a little different, but the most typical description is that uh, Joseph Smith had a hat. He would put the stone, his seer stone in the hat. He would put his face in the hat and essentially say that God was showing him the characters on the plate. And then the words in English would be under the characters. Here, too, is my picture from Preach My Gospel, which I would be able to show investigators. Uh, we see Joseph Smith with the gold plates and Oliver Cowdery, I assume, writing down what he's saying to him. Martin Harris was another scribe in the early days. David Whitmer, who was a friend of Oliver Cowdery, also uh, watched the, the translation process happen. Uh, he did not participate in the translation from what I can tell, but he did get to, you know, visit and watch. In his words, he says, Joseph Smith would put the seer stone in a hat, put his face in the hat, drawing it closely around his face to exclude the light and the darkness, um, and in the darkness, the spiritual light would shine. A piece of thing, rep a piece of something resembling a parchment would appear. So this is what Joseph said he's seeing in the hat. And on that would appear the writing. One character at a time would appear, and under it would, was the interpretation in English. Brother Joseph would read off the English to Oliver Cowdery, who was his principal scribe, and when it was written down and repeated to Brother Joseph to see if it was correct, then it would disappear, and another character with the interpretation would appear. Uh, he says, thus, the Book of Mormon was translated by the gift and power of God, not by the power of any man. So interesting. So interesting. <laughs> it is kind of crazy that I think when sometimes people, when I was still very active, would say things like he was looking in a hat. I'd be like, one person said that once, I'm sure. <laughs> it's every person who translated the book with him that said this. Like, And the, the church, too. It's not like the church now at this point tries to disavow this. They don't say it's false, but then they still publish these pictures uh, like the ones I've showed you in the child's book and in Preach My Gospel, they and in the TV show, in the, the movie I showed you, they publish these as if this is the main way or the only way it happened. It's this messy gray area to me of morality where they're presenting it as this is totally 100% this is the way it happened. Uh, it just feels deceptive, but it, it isn't quite a lie. And that's tricky. A few, a few accounts from uh, other people who said that this is what was really going on. Um, Fawn Brody, she's the one that wrote No Man Knows My History, the most eminent of Joseph's unbelieving biographers, referred to a neighbor's account of Joseph filling his frock with white sand and telling his family it was the gold plates. Dan Vogel, a recent biographer, hypothesizes that Joseph fabricated the plates from tin while he was at Camorra. Contemporaries speculated, so basically as he's going to visit the plates, he's building them out of tin. He's somehow pressing the plates together. Contemporaries speculated that he wrapped a tile brick in a cloth. One deception led to another until Joseph had fabricated a fabulous tale. So there are so many different explanations for what was underneath or what was within this, you know, linen tablecloth that he had them wrapped in. Believers obviously say it was the literal gold, gold plates. Uh, Non-believers say it was a brick. It was some other thing that was heavy. He, he somehow pressed tin together to make little plates and that's what he was carrying around. You know, uh, there's, there are obviously many different theories, none of which can be proven to be true. Joseph Smith said that the plates were uh, written in Reformed Egyptian. This is an example of characters that Joseph Smith said he copied from the golden plates. So you can see um, it looks a little bit like a mishmash. I'll put a big picture of that over the screen for a second so that if you want to pause, you can look at it with a little bit more detail. And according to No Man Knows My History and Rough Stone Rolling, it was pretty much believed at this time that no one on the planet could translate Egyptian. Uh, the Rosetta Stone was found basically at the same time that this was happening. And so some people began to have access to how to, you know, decipher Egyptian. But in Joseph Smith's, you know, little corner of the world, 
he was probably under the impression that no one would ever be able to translate Egyptian. And so, you know, people who don't believe in him say he probably chose Egyptian because it's the most irrefutable character because everyone thought it was indecipherable. When questioned why the plates were written in Egyptian rather than Hebrew, because this is a record of Hebrew people from Jerusalem, Joseph Smith said uh, they took less space on the page. And so this must be the method that the prophets used to transcribe on the gold plates. Obviously etching characters into gold must have been uh, quite laborious if it is true that this is how they were writing their history, their, their little history of their experiences, these Native Americans. And so because this would have been a very time intensive process, they chose to use the language of Reformed Egyptian rather than use Hebrew, which is what you would assume they would speak as people from Jerusalem. One little tidbit to add about the Book of Mormon is that uh, a primary portion of the Book of Mormon is that Jesus Christ comes after he's resurrected, he comes over to the Americas and visits the Native Americans here. And this is a record of that. So if you read in the Book of Mormon, there is a few chapters where Jesus Christ comes to the Native Americans. And that was always definitely one of my favorite parts of the Book of Mormon. Um, people who believe in the Book of Mormon say, hey, if Jesus appeared to people in the Middle East, why would he also not appear to people in the Americas? God loves all of his children. This is uh, something I would say on my mission to explain why they, they would also be visited by Jesus Christ. Some members of the church also theorize that Quetzalcoatl, who is an Aztec deity, uh, is Jesus Christ. Christ. He is sometimes, I guess, Quetzalcoatl referred to as having a white beard or being a god of white. And so, uh, and he's ascend descending from the sky. So some people theorize that Quetzalcoatl is Jesus Christ when he's depicted, because, you know, obviously if Jesus, you know, because obviously in the Book of Mormon, when Jesus comes, it's this massive event. There's earthquakes. He comes and descends from the sky. He's, you know, this white godlike being emanating light. Uh, obviously, if this did happen historically, this is an event that would have been painted about, talked about, written, you know, inscribed in cave drawings, whatever. It seems like there should be some um, Native American lore to point to to show, look, this must be uh, a depiction of Jesus Christ. And some Mormons believe that that's Quetzalcoatl. Uh, I'll put a link to that below and also um, include a photo of that obviously here. Uh, so, you know, there is some searching for evidence and proof within Native American culture, within Native American artifacts to try to show and prove, hey, this, look, this, this little, you know, tidbit here, this is proof that um, Jesus Christ really did visit the Americas. Just a reminder before we continue, uh, please like this video, subscribe to my channel if you haven't already, and drop a comment, you know, about anything that stood out to you, or if you have a link to a, you know, historic source that you think is worthwhile to look at. Let's talk about the character of Martin Harris. Martin Harris is one of the most interesting characters I kind of rediscovered as I went through my journey of reading all of this and relearning the story of Joseph Smith. So Martin Harris was somewhat wealthy. Uh, he was a very early believer of Joseph Smith. He, he believed Joseph Smith could talk to God and he was willing to stake a large amount of money on it. So he said he was willing to fund the printing of the Book of Mormon. Martin Harris did assist Joseph Smith in the early translation of the Book of Mormon. Martin Harris's wife, however, Lucy Harris, was not too pleased about the situation. She thought Joseph Smith was lying to Martin. She was worried Joseph Smith was going to ruin their family financially by getting uh, Martin Harris to mortgage his farm. As much as Martin really was a true believer of Joseph Smith, his wife uh, was kind of saying, hey, this doesn't seem like the best idea. A very hilarious version of this story is told by South Park in a South Park episode called All About the Mormons. And I highly recommend, you know, you watch it Maybe not if you're a sensitive soul because they do make fun of Mormons, but if you are an ex-Mormon like me, it's a bit cathartic, but they do uh, cover the story of Martin Harris a little bit in the South Park episode. So I'm going to play a clip of that and then we'll discuss, you know, what, what it is they're referring to here. Martin went home to his wife, dum-dum-dum-dum-dum. 
and showed her pages from the Book of Mormon. Dum, 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 dum. And so Joseph Smith put his head into a hat and, and read to me what the golden plate said. I wrote it all down and we're going to publish it into a book. So Martin asks Joseph, okay, if I can't see the plates, if my wife can't see the plates, can I at least take these, uh, you know, the, the pages that we've been working on and show her the pages of the manuscript to prove that... I, I like this project we're working on is legitimate. This is from God. And unfortunately, at that time, there's no copy machines. So there's only the one, you know, set of pages ever. There's no there's no second set anywhere. So he's essentially asking, can I take the only copy we've been working on and prove to my wife that this is legit. Joseph doesn't want to at first. He prays and finally God and him, I guess, relent. And Martin Harris is allowed to go take the 116 pages to his wife to try to give legitimacy to this project and say, hey, this is a worthwhile investment. I think it's also worth mentioning that this is the really the only person who has come forward to say, I will put hard money, my own money, into Joseph Smith's project. And so there are a lot of accounts of Martin Harris being a bit kooky um, and a little crazy, but I think the reason probably, at least in my opinion, that Joseph Smith was willing to carry on with this somewhat kooky guy um, is that he had money. And the reason he's willing to give him this manuscript is because he has money. And this is his only opportunity to get this book published and to potentially, in a faithful view, become a prophet and in an unfaithful view, to get his name in the papers, to write this book, to call himself a prophet. Martin, how do you know he isn't just making stuff up and pretending he's translating off golden plates? Lucy Harris, smart, 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 smart. I do love... Um, the feminist in me but in both Bushman and Brody's accounts there's so many times where all the wives are like you know Joseph Smith's wife Martin Harris's wife are like hey um I don't know about this it doesn't seem like this is a good idea or hey this seems like it's fake or it seems like he's making this up and the men are like no we're very sure we will plow ahead uh, but the women are in the background being like maybe we shouldn't be doing this maybe we should be farming so that we can have money and we can feed our children we just had so let's find out what Lucy does why would he make it up Martin Harris dum -da -dum. all right here I'm gonna hide these pages. If Joseph Smith really is translating off of golden plates, then he'll be able to do it again. But if Joseph Smith is making it all up, then the new translations will be different from these. Okay, fine. I bet I'll have no problem. Lucy Harris, smart, smart, smart. Martin Harris, dumb. My most requested video is a reaction to that whole episode, and I promise it's coming, so make sure to subscribe so that you see it. Um, but for today, we're talking about Martin Harris and Lucy. Lucy takes the pages and locks them away. Um, initially, they show them to some family members, but when Martin goes to uh, return to Joseph and continue the translation process, he finds that the, the pages have mysteriously vanished. And so he goes back, he says this to Joseph, and Joseph is mad and he's very upset. They had spent quite a bit of time working on those pages and also he probably, and he also seems to recognize it's a bit of a trap because he will have to reproduce word for word every single word on those pages because if he has the source document, the source text, which is the gold plates, he should have no problem in literally replicating word for word what was on the pages that Lucy took. Um, and so he begins to be very stressed because obviously uh, a, a believer would say, well, he's stressed because all of his work got lost and he's put back for, you know, he's he's... He's taken 10 steps back in this process. A uh, non-believer would say he's upset because he knows he won't be able to replicate the word for word, what was on the pages. And so he's been caught in his uh, deception. That same year in 1828, uh, there was another event with the Harrises. This was actually take t this actually took place slightly before uh, they lost the 116 pages. Uh, Miss Harris obviously continues with her uh, questioning about the support of this project. And so Harris, Martin Harris, asks if he can take the plates or take the pages to a, uh, a professor and essentially have the characters 
certified as being reformed Egyptian, certified as being legitimate. And Joseph does end up uh, writing some characters or transcribing some of the characters onto paper and gives them to Martin Harris, who ends up with someone named Charles Anton, who is a professor of Greek and Latin at Columbia at the time. So Joseph wouldn't let him take the plates, but he does send him with a copy of the characters. Uh, there are several different, there are two, there are two primary accounts of how this all played out. Uh, Anton says he immediately recognizes that this is a, you know, a false translation, that it's all made up. This is Anton, you know, Charles is saying, this is made up. Um, and there's evidence here that you're getting scammed. I think you're getting scammed. And I, I do not certify that these are legitimate characters. That's Anton's account. Um, Harris, however, Martin Harris says that he initially shows Charles Anton, the characters on the page, Charles Anton says, yes, they are what you say they are. These are a reformed Egyptian characters and they are written correctly. Um, but then, and, but Harris says that when Anton asks, Hey, where did you get these? That Harris tells him the story, the, the gold plates, the whole shebang. And that at that point, the Columbia professor says, no, this is all made up and takes the certification that he's written and rips it up and says, you'll have to bring the book to me and I need to see it myself. Uh, Martin Harris says the book is sealed. This is a story Mormons are familiar with. And Charles Anton says, I cannot read a sealed book. Someone points out at the time that in Isaiah, in the Bible, chap in chapter 29, verse 11, it says, and, and the vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one that is learned, read, saying, read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I cannot, for it is sealed. And so um, someone, uh, and so Martin Harris comes back with this story about the, the man said he can't read the book because it's sealed. And it comes out that, you know, some people say Joseph Smith found it himself. Some people say other people pointed it out, but that in, that in the Bible, there's this prophecy about a man saying, you know, delivering a book unto one who is learned. And the man who is learned says, I cannot read a sealed book. So this proves that Joseph Smith is a prophet and he's not only a prophet, but that he was prophesied of in the Bible, which everyone takes to mean, obviously, that he is a, a prophet of God. Um, believers take that. Um, I think there are a lot of uh, conflicting, you know, there are a lot of conflicting motivations here because keep in mind, you know, most of this is just happening between Martin Harris, Joseph Smith, and Emma, Emma Smith. And Martin Smith is laying most of his financial well-being, most of his money on the line for Joseph. He's also having, he also has a wife who is saying, I'm going to, you know, divorce you. I don't believe this is true. I don't want you to be doing this. And he is disobeying his wife. He's going against his wife's wishes in order to support Joseph. And so they all really have a lot of skin in the game for this to be successful. Uh, when it comes to the, I cannot read a sealed book, um, Charles Anton obviously said he never said that. He, he disagreed with this account that Martin had uh, come back to Joseph to tell. Um, but, but between Martin and Joseph, there, there comes out this story about I cannot read a sealed book, which is then also shown to be in the Bible. Faithful believers would look at that and say, look at this miracle Joseph Smith was prophesied of in the Bible. This is further proof that he was a prophet of God. Um, someone like me would say, you know, everyone who was involved in producing that story that says it happened had a huge amount of motivation to, to make sure that the Book of Mormon was a success, that Joseph Smith was... Uh, made to be a prophet as he said he was and that you know someone like Anton Charles Anton was a liar and a intellectual you know that want that didn't be have faith and he was probably an atheist anyways you know so just like in the, the rest of the Joseph Smith story there are definitely two sides there are definitely two sides of the coin whether you're a believer or not really covers how you end up interpreting what this story means. That later Martin Harris was excommunicated from the church. He was rebaptized, but then later joined uh, another offshoot that came from Joseph Smith. After after Joseph Smith died, he joined. He said Brigham Young 
was an apostate. He said that that branch, Brigham Young's branch of Mormonism, was not the true branch of Mormonism. He was in and out of other versions of Mormonism basically for the rest of his life. His wife, Lucy Harris, did end up eventually basically leaving him and living on her own. Uh, and he remained kind of the kooky character he had been all along, even prior to meeting Joseph Smith. And so I think in Martin Harris, we really see an example of the church using his name as a faithful figure because he ended up being one of the three witnesses. And even though later we see that he he left the church, he joined other versions of the church, we certainly never hear, though, that that is the outcome for M Martin Harris. Uh, he is only ever posited as a wealthy businessman who invested his money into a young prophet, you know, uh, and he had a harlot of a wife who stole the, the 116 pages because she wasn't a believer. And so I, I do feel like Martin Harris, Emma is another example of someone who is whose name is used very pointedly at specific points in the story to elevate Joseph Smith. But as soon as their names no longer elevate Joseph Smith, they disappear from the narrative entirely. And it's it's one of the deceptions that I think is very clear and the church is very good at in, you know, carefully cultivating this narrative is that some people, you know, you never really hear how they came into the picture. You probably never really hear how they leave the picture. Emma, Emma thought, you know, one of her sons should be prophet. She didn't believe in Brigham Young, but we certainly never see her voicing those opinions and thoughts in official church manuals. Her name is only used at the points that it is most convenient to show her as a faithful wife and believer of Joseph Smith's church. It feels icky to me that all these years later, these people's names are essentially used as props, even though they were real human beings and we don't get to see any of the dimensionality. We don't get to see the, the negatives or the disbelief with the belief. We only get to see uh, the pristine version that promotes the most faithful um that promotes the most faithful depiction of who Joseph Smith was. Faithful account from the LDS Church is that the Book of Mormon was done in 75 working days. That timeline is uh, disputed. Um, the Book of Mormon was eventually published. At the time of its publishing, the people organized a boycott of, of the, the purchasing of the book. Um, it was even hard for them to get it published to begin with because uh, people were boycotting against it. They did say a lot of people, you know, the reason for the boycott was they said that it was heresy, that there were no other versions of the Bible. As much as I grew up calling it the gold plates, the people of the time usually use the term gold Bible. And I think that it was seen as very heretical uh, that there would be another version of the Bible. This video, I will say, is an official part one of the story. As you can tell, it's pretty long um, because it almost feels that to give a pot, it almost feels to give, you know, clear, a clear view of Joseph Smith and to cover the sources and to talk about all these things. I mean, I did a lot of research for this video. I, I didn't write a whole book, though. Um, and so this is part one. Uh, I hope to have part two. It may end up needing to be part three just because there is a lot of ground to cover. Of course, want to present it as, as accurately and historically true as possible. Uh, I anticipate a video like this in the same way that when Fawn Brody published her book in 1940, it caused a lot of people to question their faith. If this video, you're watching it as a faithful member of the church or a nuanced member of the church, I would highly suggest reading these books yourself. Um, I, I, enjoy, I appreciate that on the Wikipedia pages for all these different topics, you can typically go see primary sources. If you go on the footnotes, they'll click through to something, you know, a, a foot, a actual historical document that's in Joseph Smith's handwriting himself. I do recommend looking at as many historical sources as possible in order to you know, uh, kind of work through for yourself the he said, she said of it all. This video, while it was quite long and took me a bit to make, is still simply an overview. And I, I would I would posit this video as a jumping off point for additional research. I and I certainly hope that, you know, after watching this, if you feel you're questioning a lot about Joseph Smith, 
I, I highly suggest additional research. Ultimately, I do think people have commented that they have made choices based off of, you know, um, I have a video about serving a mission. Some people have commented and said, I chose not to serve a mission because of this video. Um, information does often make us change our minds and make us make new decisions. Uh, I do encourage you though, because I am just one person and I am just one voice, pulling what I feel like I should say in my video about Joseph Smith. As much as I'm using many different resources, I highly suggest do do your own research, find your own answers, uh, go through and wrestle with this information in the way that I did. And I grew up absolutely loving Joseph Smith. I absolutely love to sing the song, oh, how lovely was the morning. You know, that song would make me cry, picturing God uh, appearing to G Joseph Smith, you know. Um, I visited Carthage Jail once and I put my finger through the bullet hole in the door where Hiram was shot and stood at the window where Joseph Smith fell out, you know. I really revered this man as the most important prophet to have ever lived and, you know, a few steps down from Jesus Christ himself. And so it's, it is interesting to revisit this in this land of, you know, disbelief that I live in because I, and I see, like I said, at the top of the video all the time on Reddit, people just on the ex Mormon subreddit coming and saying, what's the truth? I just want to know the truth. I don't want to know the Mormon version, but I also don't want to know the ex Mormon version. I just want to know with no bias, what really happened to Joseph Smith almost two centuries ago. So I know it's hard. I know it's confusing. And I, my heart aches, honestly, for anyone who would watch a video like this or read a book like No Man Knows My History or even Rough Stone Rolling. And I can picture you honestly crying. I really can. Um, because basing, basing your life, <sighs> basing your life around this man, this, this Joseph Smith, this person, this name you hear every moment growing up, basing everything you do off of his teachings, off of this gospel he said he restored. It's very all consuming. And for it to fall, um, I can picture, you know, I can picture little Alyssa. I can picture little Alyssa watching a video like this. And Sorry really didn't think I would cry. <laughs> I don't know why I'm crying. I mean, I've this video now, I'm almost, I'm three and a half hours into recording this. I'm sure that the edit will be much shorter. I hope it will be at least somewhat shorter. Maybe I'm just tired, but I'm sure someone will make a stupid video of this and be like, look at, she's crying, Ugh, you know, make fun of me, but I'll keep it in because I think it's, you know, I, I saw a video of someone reacting to one of my videos that was just like, if you want to leave the church, just sleep in on Sunday. And that is said with so much disrespect and, you know, disrespect all you want, you know, words are just words, but it is sad that people don't understand what it is like to have the, have the veil fall from your eyes a little bit and see the man behind the curtain and realize like I served, I served a mission. I got married in the temple. I, I based so much of my life off of this and I can just picture, I picture why I'm crying. I picture myself watching this or someone like me watching this video and crying because this information feels like, because it, because it feels like this information is life destroying. It feels like, you know, and this is just part one. I haven't even, I haven't even talked about polygamy yet. I, you know, I have, there's so much about Joseph Smith that we didn't even talk about yet. Um, but the idea that maybe the first vision never happened, even just that, you know, or the idea that, you know, he couldn't retranslate the 116 pages. He couldn't because they didn't exist. Like all of those things are, you know, funny when you watch it on South Park, but uh, horrible when you base your entire life and your every familial relationship is rooted in this story. And so if, uh, if you made it to the end of the video and here we are, um, I really do feel for you. And it is, it is really hard. And if this video made you unhappy, that's why maybe I'm advocating for more research because I want people to make their own choices. I really want people to choose based off of 
uh, informed consent and education. I don't want you to make a choice based off this one video you watched today. Do all the research you need to do in order to feel like you're in making an informed choice about your faith and your life. And to the little Alyssa's out there who are watching this and feeling upset, it really does get better. It's really scary at the beginning and it feels like your whole family is gonna drop you and it feels like everything you've ever done was for nothing and it feels like you've given up so much or you've given so much for nothing and at least for me it was really scary but now it's really good it's really good and it'll get better um it's gonna be okay it's gonna get better and I'm gonna keep this part of the video in even though people will probably make fun of me for crying women getting emotional Ugh. anyways um but yeah I I do want to just I want to reach through the camera and say I love you um it does get better you'll find your way um you've been strong enough to have a resilient belief in the religion of your family that that means you're strong enough to have resilient belief in yourself now that you can go on and have that belief transferred to yourself and believing in yourself that you have the power to make choices for your own life. Well, I'm glad I cried at the end because typically most people don't make it through the whole video unless they care. A reminder to like, subscribe, and comment if you have anything to share about the video just to help the algorithm share this with anyone who may be curious enough to click and I will see you next week.